Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Heilbrunn, Emeritus Professor of History and History of Science at Berkeley, who is this year's Hitchcock Professor at Berkeley. Professor uh, uh, Heilbrunn created the Office for the History of Science and Technology du during his 30-year tenure at Berkeley. Uh, he was the class of 1936 professor of history and the history of science and also served as vice chancellor and chair of the Berkeley division of the academic Senate. Since his retirement, Professor Halbrun has a, been a visiting professor at UC Berkeley, Oxford University, and Yale University. He is honorary fellow of Worcester, Worcester, <laughs> Worcester College, Oxford, and now lives in England. John, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised across the bay in San Francisco. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, I should say uh, almost completely when young. Uh, my father was very much involved in uh, civic life. He was an attorney, but he served on the California, well, served on. He headed the uh, Board of Trustees of the California State Colleges, now State Universities. So I grew up in a family in which uh, what the merits and peccadilloes of uh, professors and were discussed at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, would, uh, I, I would assume it was a home with the book line library? Yes, yes. And uh, the, the, the topics at the dinner table in addition to the, the difficulties of uh, dealing with faculty included? Uh, well, uh, almost anything. Uh, my father also was very active in the World Affairs Council. Mm. of Northern California, of which he was its president for a time. And uh, what else? He uh, was the uh, leading figure in the Jewish community. And so almost anything could turn up at the dinner table. Did, did you have any teachers as a young person? I know you went to Lowell High School that, that kind of influenced you in the direction uh, of science? I don't think so. We, uh, Lowell was and is a very good general high school, so one took uh, languages and uh, history and uh, science, but uh, I didn't uh, concentrate on anything in particular. Mathematics, I did, I did concentrate on mathematics, I suppose, and that I took all that was offered. Uh, but uh, otherwise, no, except I can say that my physics teacher was so bad mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> it, he or she, I think it was, inspired me with a desire to learn how anybody or any subject so empty could have built an atomic bomb or should have been under, mm -hmm. the, uh, should, have, should have supplied the information for building such a weapon. So like uh, many other uh, uh, people influenced by, young people influenced by uh, the standing of the brilliant young physicist in song and le uh, literature, uh, I went into physics studied physics at the university. And but it wasn't because of any aptitude or any inspiration that I received in uh, high school. You, so you saw uh, uh, physics as a heroic discipline, basically? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We all did. I mean, I, I started in 1951. Yeah. And, you know, still yeah. uh, the physicists uh, were bathed in this glow of glory. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a hard subject, so people who wanted mental exercise also drifted in that direction. Mm -hmm. and, and this would have been at the, the uh, height of the legitimacy of science in the United States probably. Right well, now. I didn't know it, but of course, during my uh, undergraduate years, the fight over the National Science Foundation uh, uh, took place, and uh, uh, the AEC got involved and in, had been, stayed involved in all sorts of things. The Office of Naval Research was supply, supporting uh, uh, so-called uh, non-mission oriented research everywhere. Yeah, but I didn't know a thing about that. Mm -hmm. and, and you actually came to Berkeley, so yeah. you just went across just, the bridge. Just, just across the bridge. And, wh and what was Berkeley like then? Uh, well, when I started, uh, it was still uh, full of veterans on the mm -hmm. GI Bill. So there was a certain maturity or lack of it, depending upon which set of veterans you happen to get. <laughs> uh, and uh, they were, by and large, uh, 
intent upon moving forward their careers because, of course, they were older. Uh, but they also had a lot of school spirit, so they filled the football stadium and so on. It was uh, quite, uh, I think, uh, useful to have this older crowd around. Uh, then they uh, uh, disappeared uh, by the time I graduated. Uh, and, uh, but I still feel that uh, from what my father and mother, who were also Berkeley graduates, told me about their time, that it wasn't so different. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, of course, in the 50s. Uh, where students were relatively docile. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Berkeley at that time really lacked the, the multicultural dimension that, that it is. I, 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 well, multicultural, uh, certainly it's not as varied as it is now, but there, the, the Asian community, San Francisco Asian community was uh, uh, mm -hmm. full. Uh, the, 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 the university had great many uh, uh, students from the San Francisco Asian community, many of whom I, I knew from high school because mm -hmm. Lowell, even then, it was uh, uh, largely, though not yet the majority, uh, Asians. Uh, so, but the, the, the groups kept, to some extent, uh, separate. Mm -hmm. I did lose track of many of these friends, which I regretted. Mm -hmm. You majored in physics. Yes. And what was the physics department uh, like then, because it, the Titans were walking through the doors, right? They were, they had been here, or or, or were still here. Yes, uh, when I started graduate school in physics uh, here, uh, Ernest Lawrence was still among the living. Mm -hmm. uh, McMillan, Alvarez, Seaborg, uh, they were all around. But I was too dumb, really, to know. <laughs> uh, you should have taken history of science. I, I, I <laughs> really should have done, uh, uh, because I never set eyes on Lawrence, although, uh, which is a shame, because later I wrote a book about him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, uh, I did gradually understand uh, the importance of Alvarez and uh, company when it came time to choose a thesis advisor. Uh, but uh, no, uh, 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 although there was a portrait of Lawrence hanging in the library, which did give some hagiographical slant to things, uh, the, at least to the undergraduates and beginning graduate students, uh, the glory that was Berkeley was not trumpeted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, w uh, at what point uh, before graduation as an undergraduate or after did you uh, move to the history of science? Did, did you go to graduate school in the sciences also? And oh, then yeah, moved? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm a very slow learner, uh, and uh, so, <laughs> so, I so, so I, I was no, I, I was in graduate school in physics for three or four years when I finally decided. I was working on a dissertation, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, when I decided that uh, that really was not what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I went down to the history department. I'd always been interested in medieval history. So I went down to the history department to uh, ask whether they would have me. I was referred to the medievalist, and he patted me on the head, almost literally, in an avuncular way, and mm -hmm. he said, son, go back and finish your degree. The country needs physicists. It does not need medievalists. Mm. Oh, dear. <laughs> which, you know, which was certainly true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I went back, duly worked. More, this, this medievalist had neglected to tell me there was a person named Thomas Kuhn just arrived on the faculty mm -hmm. who was uh, fresh from Harvard and uh, an historian of science uh, who was desperate for students. Mm -hmm. I mean, so eventually I came to know Kuhn and then I changed. I, I'm a little curious about the, your, your thought processes in making the switch before you found the place in history. Was wh What did you see about yourself and the work that you were doing? Mm -hmm. Or was it the, the, the issue area, namely you, you thought it was more important to put science in the context of history? I wish I could say that. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, as I worked into my dissertation topic, I realized I'd have to know more mathematics, mm -hmm. quite a bit more mathematics to do it. And uh, so I thought as long as I was going to retool, mm -hmm. why don't I do it in something that interested me more? Mm -hmm. Not to save society, not because I mm -hmm. felt that uh, physics was going the wrong direction. No uh, big issue at all, mm -hmm. just simple uh, desire to follow what appeared to me be my interests 
and perhaps a slightly stronger suit than I had in physics. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me about uh, uh, Kuhn, because I know when, when, by, by when the 60s came around and I was here in graduate school, you know, his work was considered so very important uh, in understanding scientific revolutions. Mm -hmm. How was he as a teacher and, uh, and, and what was his influence on you? Well, he was, he was a terrific teacher if you happen to find something that worked in well with the structure of scientific revolutions. And I was lucky mm -hmm. in finding such a vein early on. And so he was, for a time, much more interested in my work than I was. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful for mm -hmm. a beginner. And uh, uh, so enthusiasm, good ideas about where to look for things, a pretty general ignorance about history. He had. He had. Yeah. He had. Yeah. And he had started in physics too, right? Is well, that he had done more than start. He, he, he got through his PhD in, oh, okay. in physics, and he got caught up in this uh, Conant program at Harvard to uh, teach undergraduates the, uh, what do they call it, the tactics and strategy of science, mm -hmm. which meant, in effect, uh, exposing them to what they called case studies of the history of science, but of past science, science so remote that even a Harvard undergraduate could understand it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, and, and so from that, uh, people were to understand how difficult it is to arrive at uh, usable, uh, effective uh, scientific theories and would uh, then uh, cheerfully pay their taxes uh, mm -hmm. to support science uh, during what was then, when Conant began to plan, it was the, the beginning of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now, and what was the topic of your dissertation that interested uh, uh, Kuhn? Oh, uh, uh, actually, it wasn't my dissertation. Oh, it was, it was <laughs> what you were interested in. Okay. No, it's the, the first set of papers I wrote for him as a, as a student. Uh, they had to do with early electricity, electricity mm -hmm. primarily in the 18th century. And uh, it happened that uh, the development of the subject fit his ideas mm -hmm. fairly well. Mm -hmm. And so he was quite interested. My, my, my thesis was on the history of uh, the atomic models in the 20th century, mm -hmm. quantum theory and things like that, mm -hmm. which was an outgrowth of a project that uh, he headed up and I participated in to interview quantum physicists and to uh, collect their documents, letters, records, papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and just in passing, what, what department was he in? Was he in philosophy or he was in history? He, he, he was half, he began half in history and half in philosophy. But then when it came time for the tenure decision, he became 100% in history. I see. Okay. Let's talk a little about uh, doing history and then the history of science. What, what do you see as, as the skills uh, involved uh, uh, in, in, in doing the work that you do? Other than patience? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, patience, uh, but that's, that, uh, I was uh, going to uh, ask uh, you about that. But right, because I mean, that, that is one, just to revert to Kuhn for a minute, that's, that's one of the things that he lacked as historian. He didn't have the metabolism of an historian. Mm -hmm. Sluggish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, patience and, is better, better uh, one, yeah. Patience is, is, is yeah. perhaps better. And uh, the idea of uh, reading lots of documents, many of which are going to yield very little, mm -hmm. was not his notion of good fun. Mm -hmm. So, but, but what else? I mean, students what else? watching this program, I'm patient, okay, if you don't have it, don't do it. But what, well, what? I, I think you need a funny combination of patience and boldness. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you, you have to impose your structure on the world. Uh, reading historical documents does not give you history as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to have uh, principles for selection and for organization, which naturally means you're going to leave things out. Mm -hmm. However, a third point, you have to have respect for the evidence. And some of the things that are written now and no doubt were always written, but of which I'm particularly conscious now. Have some good ideas, and no doubt the writer tries to mm -hmm. impose upon the material. But the way of arguing, the way of treating evidence, 
respect for uh, the testimony of the past is often lacking. Mm -hmm. So I would say to anybody out there who might be listening, common sense way of arguing is uh, far better often than these fancy methods that are dreamt up in order to limit the materials to suit a certain point of view. So, Harry, if you're going to be an historian, you must cultivate patience. Mm -hmm. You must cultivate respect for the sources. And by respect, I mean not only uh, the taking them at face value insofar as you can, uh, but also paying attention to what others have written mm -hmm. about the subject. I think that too many uh, beginners think that they should begin with the archives, with the uh, first piece of paper that was written on mm -hmm. some such subject. They early learn that that's not possible, then they go to imposing their mm -hmm. will. Uh, but you have to read good secondary writers and you have to know uh, their points of view so as to be able to, to judge them. But uh, we too, despite what Kuhn said, we too, we historians, we build upon our predecessors. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in listening to your lectures and, and looking at some of your books, I think that one what gets into science that there's really uh, uh, two important things that stand out. One, in, in your lectures, uh, to, to in a way be a cosmopolitan yourself, be well versed in, uh, in languages and uh, to essentially play off uh, the conversation mm. in different parts of the world during a p historical period. Is that fair? Or is that a fair? Yeah, this, this is one of the old slogans in history. You know, you, you, you are able to converse with whatever mind you choose from the past. Well, that's a little bit bold, but uh, certainly if uh, you know the language of this person, uh, then you can enter into some kind of relationship, perhaps a, a bit of a necro a bit of necromancy is uh, mm -hmm. required, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know uh, 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 that's one of the great treats mm -hmm. of history. It frees you time and place from time and place. And, and to really get into uh, uh, the head uh, of uh, the principle you're looking at, because in fact, on the one hand, he may be a scientist, but on the other, he may think he's God, basically, uh, or a prophet, as mm -hmm. you discussed in yesterday's lecture. Yes, though I would not presume to get into the mind of uh, anyone who thought himself God. <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, one has to, of course, construct the persona of this uh, person with whom you are conversing. Uh, and you're not climbing into his head and thinking his thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. You are constructing from what uh, remains there may be, which are not necessarily only literary. Uh, you know, what sort of paintings did this person like? Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of music? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so on. Uh, but you are constructing a, uh, an artificial person, and, and, and the, uh, your success uh, depends upon verisimilitude, how you are able to make use of what is known in order to construct a uh, plausible picture, a bit like a novelist, but you're more constrained. Mm -hmm. And also in the history of science, it, it's very clear in, in looking at your work, you, you really have to understand the technical issues, the, the struggle with ideas mm. in the science that the figure you're writing about uh, was it, involved it's, in. It's best to be able to do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not absolutely required, yes. Uh. Uh, but also then to be able to write about it clearly. Yeah. Because you, you're not, you, you may put down the formulas, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but in fact you have to explicate because the people who may be your primary readers are, are not necessarily try, scientifically trained. Well, you're absolutely right. You have a, your finger on a, a big problem which gets more uh, difficult as the science you review comes closer to the present and gets more difficult. That's why I mentioned in the Harvard case studies method, uh, the idea was to use old dead science because it was qualitative and made, uh, didn't make such great demands upon the students. So, right, uh, how then to inform people in an interesting way about what you have found out about some 
person who science may need, they may, may need some background to understand. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in looking at, at uh, your, uh, your publications, uh, 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 there are three biographies of scientists in different periods, or at least of the ones mm -hmm. that I uh, sort of uh, looked at. Uh, 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 I'm trying to think, uh, Max Planck, uh, right. uh, Lawrence. An Englishman named Mosley. And Mosley, yeah. And, and so, uh, uh, w w w was it a common set of problems and all in, in digging in and coming to understand them? They, they had very different life stories and right. they lived in very different eras. Right. Well, partly opportunism. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Mosley, I found a big chunk of letters that nobody knew existed. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, tracked them down in an old Saxon house uh, way out in the country in England. Uh, Planck was something the same. I, by chance, happened to find out, uh, well, actually, another project I was working on found out that uh, although Planck's own home and uh, his papers had been destroyed by the uh, U.S. Army Air Force during the war, uh, Second World War, uh, there were great quantities of the letters he had written that mm -hmm. had been preserved by people like Einstein and uh, Bohr and uh, von Auer and so forth. So. That made another uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 set of material that nobody had worked up before. And as for uh, the third one, Lawrence, that had to do once again with the uh, 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 circumstances that uh, uh, made it opportune, reasonable to uh, tackle Lawrence at the time. So I cannot claim mm -hmm. any uh, organic unity to that work. Uh, in 10 years' time, if I'm asked to reminisce, I'll probably construct, I will have constructed some uh, uh, line that ties them all together. But mm -hmm. you can take it from me mm -hmm. that there is none. There Ex is none. None, yeah. except that I do like the genre, mm -hmm. biography. And I'm engaged in a biography right now, which is about a guy who couldn't be more different from any of those three, or from myself, for that matter. Mm -hmm. An Italian who lived from 1663 to 1729, mm -hmm. and uh, who, to me, is very interesting because he um, was an expert at so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you see as your primary audience uh, as a historian of science? I, I mean, I know that, that you probably want to reach a wider audience uh, than either historians or scientists, but. But uh, what is the answer here? Well, um, I've changed, of course, over mm -hmm. the years. When I began, I felt, as do many beginners, and rightly, they should write for those who are going to judge them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, gradually, I have tried to reach wider audiences. And my test for that is simple. Uh, uh, does my conversation about these subjects interest anybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if the answer is no, I realize that I'm probably uh, not going to succeed in attracting a readership. I don't want a great big readership, but I would like to be able to uh, say that uh, at least some of my work has interested and diverted and maybe possibly instructed uh, more than a handful of people. Uh, I'm curious about uh, this uh, focus on personality in, mm -hmm. in these three biographies. Do, do you see that as a way to uh, draw people into elevating consciousness about the problems and yes. the history of science? Because it, 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 it's fascinating. In the case of Mosley, you know, just zipping through the book, the, the whole idea that he died so young. Mm. I mean, it, you know, uh, yeah, the biographer's the, delight, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you could make a romantic uh, 40s movie out of his life, maybe. But you could. So, you yeah, could. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yes, I, I, it, it does enable you to draw uh, people in uh, with some kind of a human, obvious mm -hmm. human hook. Uh, it also provides a, a chronology, uh, ready-made, it, it, uh, and uh, provides a selection process, ready-made. So, in a way, biography is one of the easiest of genres. Mm -hmm. uh, though uh, I think you do need a little bit uh, 
of a uh, novelist's touch to uh, to create uh, the persona. Was was doing uh, the uh, the work on Lawrence and the Lawrence Lab easier or harder? I mean, obviously you were here, mm. you knew many of the principals who were still living, yeah. uh, 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 but the material was all here. Yes. Right. So, so what uh, was was there any particular intellectual mm. uh, problem set that you had to deal with as you got into this material? Well, a little bit, but if I can uh, uh, revise the uh, question a little oh, bit. Oh, please do, uh, please uh, do, yeah. Uh, although all the material about, virtually all the material about the laboratory was here, uh, my interests also uh, have to do, had to do with visitors to the lab. And so I read a lot of uh, letters from visitors back mm. to their home countries, which required visiting archives abroad. And the only reason I mention that is that uh, one of the, uh, if the book has any strengths, one of them is uh, that the laboratory is seen not only from through the eyes of those who worked here, but also mm. uh, through the eyes of visitors, some of whom were not as ecstatic about the way things were done as were the uh, the cronies of Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence, as a figure, was was uh, a, a very colorful guy, an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and and uh, that dimension of his career stands out as much as his science. I think. Is oh yeah. Right? Uh, when, uh, the, the 30s, which we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, during the 30s, Lawrence changed quite a bit. And so one of the uh, interesting features, or one of the interesting storylines in this history is to show how Lawrence, who began as a uh, sort of a comrade of the senior students in the uh, laboratory, uh, gradually as the search for money and the, uh, and the uh, his association with the people who could provide it uh, turned him to the right. Uh, well, he developed, and uh, with consequences that do we try to point out in the book. I say we because I had a co-author. We must uh, acknowledge Robert Seidel. Mm -hmm. And is that the Seidel who worked uh, with Oppenheimer, or uh, or he? Uh, uh, no, he was a, he was a graduate student. Oh, he was a graduate student here. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Now you you did a book, a very well received book, which won uh, uh, the the Pfizer Prize, called "The Sun in the Church: Cathedrals as Solar Observatories." How how did you wind up doing that? And I, I mean, it, says, it sounds utterly fascinating mm -hmm. because it, it points to a link between science and religion yeah. that, that, that the popular notions are, are just wrong yeah, about. Yeah, right. Well, this was the greatest uh, research project I ever had mm -hmm. because I didn't have to be to the research site, as it were, uh, which were these cathedrals, which served as solar observatories, until noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> of course, a, 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 after uh, my deep yes. observation, yes. I had to adjourn to the trattoria around the corner to, uh, <laughs> uh, what should I say, digest my research material. Okay. Uh, so, but it, it, uh, there again, I, I cannot claim that uh, I had gone around searching for a topic that would illuminate the connections between religion and science, but rather tripped over mm -hmm. uh, one of these long lines embedded in the uh, pavement of a cathedral. This is the, well, it's not a cathedral. Uh, the, uh, let's see, where was it? I guess it is, a, at, yeah, San Petronio in Bologna, uh, uh, a cathedral, uh, which um, uh, uh, runs for about 250 feet. Mm -hmm. And this line uh, is the new mark. So the sun stands directly over it in the meridian of the place mm -hmm. uh, at noon. And uh, from the position of the sun's image on this line during different parts of the year, the sun is higher in the summer, the image is closer to the vertical, etc. Uh, you can learn things about uh, the solar orbit. And uh, ultimately, these things got to be so precise, you could tie down or answer the question whether the Earth's 
axis remains at the same angle uh, to the plane of its motion during the year. This is a very subtle effect, and it was first tied down at these solar observatories. So, I, I mean, these, these cathedral observatories. That fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I tried to study as many as I could find which did contribute to astronomy. Mm -hmm. And in the process, found out all kinds of things about mm -hmm. the relationship between uh, astronomy and uh, the Catholic Church in the years after the condemnation of Galileo. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be uh, quite illuminating to see mm -hmm. how what was, no matter what you have to say about it, no matter which side of the story you stand, was a stupid administrative decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then better administrators of the next generation had to figure out how to impose this uh, uh, prohibition against the teaching of uh, Copernicanism, like this, the sun-centered universe. And uh, the ingenious ways mm -hmm. that administrators found to look the other way and astronomers found not to incite them. Mm -hmm. This I thought was a minuet uh, which I had seen performed before. <laughs> <laughs> in many different contexts. many context, different contexts, context, yes. Uh, and with the consequence that long, long before the uh, proscription against helio heliocentrism was removed from the index of prohibited books, it was standard to teach uh, the Copernican astronomy in Catholic schools, even by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in, in one issue here was that the church needed to know exactly mm. when Easter occurred. That, yes. so, so there was an instrumental reason, among I'm sure many others, that, that led them to, to sort of wink, sort of. Yes, uh, although uh, to establish Easter, uh, and it, Easter is a, a, a lunar solar holiday, uh, and that means the calendrical problem associated with it has to do with bodies that could just as well go around the Earth. One of them does, the moon, and as for whether the sun goes around the Earth or vice versa, it doesn't matter. It's only when you get the planets into the story that uh, Copernicus is so much better, clearer. Anyway, so it, you didn't have to go to a new astronomy, but you had to use astronomers in order mm -hmm. to tie down the, uh, the parameters that would give you the basis for calculating Easter more exactly. And astronomers were interested in the newest astronomy. So you were having to deal with people who, uh, whose interests would naturally cause them to uh, pay no attention to your prohibitions. Also, I should say that the same people who would be interested in calendrics, who would be interested in astronomy, whether new or old, were also the guys who, on whom you would call to uh, repair the church. Because applied mathematics included astronomy, hmm. fortification, uh, canalization of rivers, uh, hydraulics, uh, navigation, uh, astrology, whatever you want that applied mathematics. And they were, of course, necessary for the upkeep of the church's uh, uh, fabric, buildings, and also surveying the domains, uh, keeping control of the rivers. One of the most frequent things hmm. that mathematicians in Italy did in the 17th and 18th century was to advise various governments on how to control the rivers. Mm -hmm. You, uh, during your career at Berkeley, uh, were, became the vice chancellor, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to a very important role on the campus, namely the, the top academic officer and, and the person who really runs the campus, uh, you brought uh, uh, a unique perspective as a historian of science, or did it matter? So I guess what I'm trying to ask mm. you is, did being a historian of science, uh, uh, was that a good thing to have under your belt uh, when you uh, undertook uh, the role? Well, I think it was useful in that I could speak out of both sides of my mouth. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I have the vocabulary mm -hmm. that, that enabled me to talk to at least some scientists and uh, to some humanists, including historians. And that was a, a benefit. Uh, it was a most interesting experience. And I think if I can refer back to uh, my interest in how uh, 
administrators in the Catholic Church handled the pro proscription we were speaking about a minute ago. I think that was, uh, that interest arose from my own uh, academic uh, administrative responsibilities. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so that has proved, uh, that proved useful to me uh, in other approaches to history. So I, I recommend that if you can do it, take on some kind of administrative role and find out what other people really are like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, now I want to understand this. Now, th there are two things that stand out both in your lectures and here uh, and in our conversation. You have a, a real sense of whimsy mm. uh, and, a, uh, 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 and then you're now talking about the limits of what can be achieved in organizations because of the way people are, human nature and, and uh, people's interests and so on. So where did, did that come from your study of history or uh, was there a synergy between those studies and what you were learning uh, mm -hmm. as an administrator? Well, I'd, I'd like to think there was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yes, perhaps there was. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the recognition that uh, institutions, uh, though they may have a single name, uh, contain a lot of different disparate mm -hmm. elements. And uh, if you apply that insight, which you don't have to have been an administrator to have mm -hmm. achieved, to the Catholic Church, you don't go around saying the church did this, the church did that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know perfectly well there were Franciscans and there were Dominicans mm. and Jesuits and the Vatican and the Cardinals all go in different directions and so forth so that uh, the decisions that it finally reached, that is the church, the Catholic Church finally reached were mm. often uh, negotiated ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, an awareness of the complexity of, right. of institutions yeah, right. and yeah. Right, and of course we, then there's geographical differences. Yeah. For, yeah. As, as vice chancellor, did, did, was there ever a time where you, you sort of concluded that you were really learning something mm. about the organization of oh, science yeah. that you had not known as a historian or had not come across in your, your previous uh, work? Uh, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. You learn various things uh, of great importance. For example, who wrote the memo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you will have a conversation with somebody about something that needs to be done and uh, you agree what is to be uh, said and then the other fellow goes and writes you your memo mm -hmm. to which you then respond to. So I learned that uh, you can't even tell from the signature <laughs> who had the principal input into a document. It might very well be the recipient and not the sender. Mm -hmm. Uh, I learned uh, any number of things, which I probably should not disclose. <laughs> but one of the things I learned yeah. about was, the, uh, was that our faculty, whose minds are so vast, they encompass the universe, mm -hmm. uh, are generally unable to understand the concept of overhead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the most interesting parts of my job Mm -hmm. was trying to explain to a disbelieving faculty mm -hmm. that they did not own the overhead re mm -hmm. <laughs> recovered by the university so on we their should research explain, grant. Yeah, we should explain to our audience, when you get, a, say, a federal grant, there is a charge uh, put on the grant which the university gets because of its costs in running the university. That's it. That's it. Right. Which, uh, at, when I was here, was a little under 50%. Mm -hmm. We just interviewed uh, uh, Donald Kennedy yesterday and this topic uh, came up, <laughs> so it must uh, be indeed, something indeed. dear to the hearts. Uh, is there, it, what, in your role as vice chancellor, is, what was your biggest challenge, basically? Was there one particular problem that you had to deal with that, deal with that stands out in retrospect or uh, that was a problem of the particular time, you know, when you yeah. were the vice chancellor? Well, we, I think we had a lot of problems, uh, uh, but they were many of them of the uh, standard kind that mm -hmm. can't be solved, just ameliorated. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were to some degree intensified by the uh, 
the fact that during the four years I was vice chancellor, our state budget was cut regularly mm -hmm. each year. Now, that's bad, but it's not all bad mm -hmm. because if you have to make deep enough cuts, then you have to make decisions. And I think that although that was probably the toughest thing we had to do, uh, nonetheless it was in some sense the most creative. When everything is going very well and this year you're incrementally better than you were last year, you don't go back to anything like zero-based budgeting. You just let things go. Mm -hmm. But if you have to cut what I've now forgotten, but I think it was something like an accumulated cut of 30% in state funds. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about decisions uh, of importance. And I think that we, on the whole, navigated fairly well through that uh, bad time and uh, were able to, um, by creative use of such things as the retirement incentives, uh, which enabled us to switch some monies about, uh, managed to get through without uh, doing real damage to the uh, program, the instructional and research program of the university. When, when you have budget cuts, and I'm not talking about your uh, uh, tenure as vice chancellor, it's, it's often the case that the humanities suffer more uh, the, the, than the other disciplines. Are we going to pay a price for that in the sense that it would seem that it, as there's more and more change with science mm -hmm. that the, the, you, you, the humanities are more important than ever. Well that would be my position. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the question whether uh, the humanities are more vulnerable to uh, budget cuts or not, it, it, this is not so easy to say uh, because uh, the overhead in the sciences having to do with laboratories and so on and so forth, uh, does in some respects make it more vulnerable. When all your money is in salaries of tenured faculty, uh, it's hard to save anything mm -hmm. without closing down a department. If you ever try to do that around here, you, <laughs> you will know that there are some causes that are truly hopeless. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, yes, but not perhaps they're more vulnerable, but because they're loaded on uh, here on tenured faculty, uh, there isn't much uh, you can do except not to fill vacant slots, which is one of the things that we did. We just let openings accumulate and uh, use the salary savings for programmatic purposes. But the other question would be something like, uh, does the uh, growth of uh, the uh, engineering side of the uh, natural sciences, engineering applications to natural sciences, and business on the campus threaten the uh, uh, health of, these, of the humanities, in which I include history. Well, I'm glad to say I'm not close enough an observer of what's going on at Berkeley at the mm -hmm. moment to offer any kind of uh, definitive answer, but I would think that from a general point of view, you could not help but worry. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, problems here, I believe, is that the uh, humanities and uh, the more humane social sciences uh, are not sufficiently aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, getting back to the, the history of science and this whole question of the humanities and and uh, the, the situation we find ourselves in today. Why, why is the history of science important for science? Hmm. Yes. Uh, well, I think the history of science is important for science in the same way that history is important for everybody, mm -hmm. for society at large. Uh, and uh, history of science uh, may be of greater interest to uh, scientists than the uh, history of Greece or something like that. But maybe not. I know lots of uh, scientists who would far rather read the history of the Middle Ages than of hmm. what, than the history of uh, science during the 19th century, which to many of them is as distant as uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, but it's history that one ought to 
read and ponder and uh, use to take distance from one's own immediate position and uh, perhaps such study might render one less arrogant uh, and uh, less confident that uh, the solutions of all time are to be found just right now by our generation. Uh, a certain amount of uh, humility is often engendered by a study of history. Often not, to be sure. But, uh, so I wouldn't say that uh, the history of science uh, provided anything in the grand picture for mm -hmm. a scientist more than history itself. And maybe history, it's, uh, general history would be even more useful. However, as a pedagogic tool, I think that the history of science has much to offer that has not been capitalized upon. For example? For example, the standard textbook presentation, which tends to be axiomatic and by principle, I mean, not necessarily formally axiomatic, but it, 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 it's arranged uh, in some sort of logical order, uh, does not reach all minds. Some people find mm. it much easier to digest information in the same way and almost in which it was found. And if not that, some sort of combination of, uh, of a wider approach to the uh, subject matter and the more uh, principled uh, uh, delivery of knowledge which is now possible. And uh, another thing is it can be psychologically very encouraging or reassuring for students to find out <clears throat> that Galileo or Bohr or mm. Maxwell didn't come to their theories uh, in a flash of genius, mm. but rather worked very hard on them and faced problems that were just the same problems that the undergraduate today has to struggle with. Mm. So I've had some uh, moderate success in teaching people uh, quantum mechanics by hmm. showing, by, by bringing them back to the problems that uh, caused people to invent it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And to show that these inventors had terrible problems and sometimes exactly the same problems that the student today had. Thermodynamics is another good case where an historical approach can be useful. I don't say it's useful for everything, but yeah. only that it is an unmined source. And, and in a society where the consequences of science are, are greater and greater every day, and we have to inform our citizenry about how to think mm. about uh, uh, science in the, in the public realm, it, 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 what you're saying strikes me as kind of a, a, an interesting way to elevate that general Well, that's one thing, but I'm glad you, you brought the matter up in the way you did because it allows me to say I think history of science is much more important for non-scientists than for scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one reason I try to write a little bit more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, if students were watching this uh, interview, how would you advise them to prepare for the future, whether as a historian or, or not? I mean, is there some, some lesson that we can draw here about uh, 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 understanding uh, current events, what's going to happen down the road in, in, in light of, of the kinds of things you study? Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to set up as guru in the whole... <laughs> I see. <laughs> but, this is but your guru moment. This is my you're... guru. No, I mean, I, 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 all I can do is to fall back on platitudes that have been around since the time mm -hmm. of Cicero, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, since no one is reading Historia Cicero. Magistra Vitae, right? I mean, history uh, tells you, uh, directs you, uh, mm -hmm. helps you um, uh, understand your predicament as a human being and by reviewing the historical record gives you some idea of the direction in which you're going, precautions to take, mm -hmm. uh, opportunities to seize, but uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not an infallible guide. But, but, but let, 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 we'll make this the final question. What about policymakers? In other words, is, is there a lesson here for the policymakers who have to deal with uh, 
you know, the issues uh, that, that are affected by science? Of course, and not only just those affected by science, and we know perfectly well. Uh, we see it dramatically exposed every day mm -hmm. uh, that uh, statesmen, uh, ignorant of uh, the circumstances in the countries they are pleased to invade, uh, not only themselves pay the price, but also everybody else. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, about that, of course, there is no doubt. Although the past doesn't tell you what the future is going to be, it can really give you good indications about what not to do. Well, on that note, John, I want to yeah. thank you from, mm. for coming back to the campus and thank you for taking time uh, to do this interview with us. I thank you, Harry. And thank yeah. you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.